Bane, Catwoman, Retirement Home Batman, <laughs> falling apart, <laughs> blowing up. What the f is going on? Let's figure it out. What's up, movie world? After counteracting four years of withdrawal symptoms with viewings of Batman Begins in the Dark Knight, we finally get the cinematic high we've been waiting for. The Dark Knight Rises. Its responsibility and challenge is a major one. Complete a high-quality trilogy. As we explore what it takes to achieve that undertaking, let's share a moment to honor those fallen franchises that began with such promise and betrayed their gifts, talents, and potential for 30 pieces of box office silver. common mistake amongst all these films was to focus more on the genre set pieces than the character journeys. If we remember successful trilogies, it's clear there's a long-term vision, a plan, an endgame for the story and characters. The teaser trailer for The Dark Knight Rises gave us movie hope immediately. If you make yourself more than just a man, devote yourself to an ideal then you become something else entirely a legend mr wayne a legend return of the jedi is a great example of what a character-based trilogy finale needs an emotionally satisfying resolution i'll not leave you here i've got to save you you already have look you were right you were right about me. Tell your sister. You were right. Father. I won't leave you. Man, that's f***ing good. There's also plenty of genre in Jedi to satisfy our spectacle-hungry imagination, but it's the balance of Luke, the Emperor, and Vader on the Death Star that give all the lights and magic impact and meaning. This is the result of balanced storytelling. Today, we just have this. Or really this. And we're moving towards this. We remember the movies that have great characters. And we love the movies that try to do something and say something more about life with those characters. No recent trilogy exemplifies this necrosis in quality Hollywood storytelling more than the $2.6 billion in worldwide gross Transformers glorified 6 plus hour CGI reel. As a side note, Batman Begins and The Dark Knight have made $1.3 billion combined. That means in order for Christopher Nolan's Batman saga, a blood, sweat, and tears story and characters first progressive addition to the evolution of cinema to make more money than Michael Bay's CGI porn hottie former's music video attention deficit disorder car commercial series, The Dark Knight Rises has to make about $1.4 billion. It has a chance, 
But if it doesn't, if the Transformers trilogy makes more money than this epically intelligent, innovative, heartfelt, and entertaining Batman saga, then we, the audience, suck. If that becomes the case, then we've failed. How the f did we give more money to this than this? How did this make more money than this? What about this bringing in more box office dollars than... Okay, okay, we get it. Christopher Nolan, in the future, you have to cast hotter ass in your movies. What's that? Somebody out there is saying that the character of Sam Witwicky in the Transformers trilogy undergoes a deep, profound character change? Hmm. Really interesting theory. Why don't we take a look at it? All right, Mojo. I got the car. Now I need the girl. You drive her home tonight. So listen, I was wondering if I could ride you home. I'd like to go faster. Well, maybe you should sit in my lap. We are the first Witwicky ever to go to college. I want to be normal, B. That's why I'm going to college. You won't give me one day in college. I'm sorry, Sam. And you still can't even tell me that you love me. There is a reason that we are here. How do you know it's gonna work? Because I believe it. You have fought for Optimus, our last descendant, with courage and with sacrifice, the virtues of a leader. A leader worthy of our secret. The matrix of leadership is not found. It is earned. Return now to Optimus. Merge the Matrix with his spark. It is, and always has been, your destiny. Took all this for you to tell me that you love me. Sam, for saving my life. You're welcome. Thank you for believing in me. I have uh, job interviews. Oh, that's good. That sucks. You're frustrated, I know. I've been there. It's called paying your dues. Well, with all due respect, young man, I appreciate what you did. But you're not a soldier. You're a messenger. You've always been a messenger. Sam wants to be in danger. He doesn't know who he is without I just it. want to matter. You matter to me. Sam, do your job. She'll be safe. I give you my word. I'll kill you. You think you're a hero? No. I'm just a messenger. I love you. You're the only thing I need in this world, and I'll do anything to make it up to you, I promise. I'm gonna hold you to that. Just never let me go. Promise. Do you feel cold? So he goes from wanting a girl to wanting to go to college to wanting another girl. Holy sh That is like totally epic. Best human personal journey evolution story ever, right? I mean, it doesn't compare even close to the character growth and journey of, let's say, Neo. Discover the nature of reality, find out you're the one, develop your powers, save humanity, and redeem the enemy with a Christ-like sacrifice for the greater good. I mean, that's like totally interesting and all, but dude like didn't tap any quality ass. And who wants to like sit around and listen to weirdo with the sunglasses talk about philosophy and This isn't real. What is real? How do you define real? If you're talking about what you can feel, what you can smell, what you can taste and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. Dude, this is summertime. What am I, like in school or something? F that. Let me out. Let me out. Let's ask ourselves, why did we go see Transformers? The answer is genre. Now if we ask, why do we want to see The Dark Knight Rises? The answer is character. The heart of the battle for movie hope is the struggle between genre and character. Stories today, born out of the movie apocalypse, are character free. 
Take a look at the marquee of your local Cineplex and you'll see that none of the current or recent or even future major releases deal with a character developing or going on a journey, which is absolutely tragic because that's one of the powers of storytelling, to explore the experience of being human. Movies don't do that anymore. Instead, they're focused on the experience of being profitable at the expense of inspiration and creativity. As writers, David Goyer, Christopher, and Jonathan Nolan have always balanced the spectrum spectacle of set pieces with the exploration of emotions and ideas. Yes, we're excited to see bridges exploding, the football field imploding, the war in the streets, and the battle in the sky. But above all, we can't wait to experience the struggle within. Why does Bane want to destroy Gotham and Batman? Is Catwoman bad or good? Can Bruce live without the Cape Crusader? What more does he have to give? How far is he willing to go? To understand what will happen in The Dark Knight Rises, we need to ask who Bruce Wayne is and who he needs to become in order to make his desires a reality. These questions lead to the answers that lead to the creation of an appropriate opponent. In any great story, the opponent is the one who helps the main character, through conflict, become the person they want to be. Let's start with Bruce's journey, who as a little boy was traumatized by fear. This inadvertently led to the death of his parents, which cancers him with anger and corrodes his soul to the point of committing murder, which doesn't happen but still leads to self-banishment and potential self-destruction. He's given a chance for redemption and rechannels his energies in the twisted and constructive creation of Batman, which culminates in one of my favorite visually and emotionally striking moments in any movie where image and score come together to strike a chord in our spirits. Awesome. At its thematic core, Batman Begins is about overcoming fear. Even the color scheme of a sickly yellowish brown heightens that idea. To personify this energy is the opponent, the Scarecrow, a twisted psychologist who uses fear to defeat his victims. It's a great blend of comic book reference and practical adaptation choices which make the movie work within the medium. The one minor character journey oversight is that since Batman already has his fears under control, the effectiveness of the Scarecrow's opposition is diffused. So much to the point that it's not even Batman who defeats him. Instead, he becomes the henchman of a greater villain, Ra's al Ghul who returns to complete the larger idea initiated earlier in the film about purging Gotham versus giving it a chance to start over. Gotham's time has come. Like Constantinople or Rome or before it. The city has become a breeding ground for suffering and injustice. It is beyond saving and must be allowed to die. This is the most important function of the League of Shadows. It is one we performed for centuries. Gotham must be destroyed. Here, Batman wins the battle, but this idea of the League of Shadows seems like it's a war, which might come back here in Rises, because it's left out of the Dark Knight. More on that in a minute. Let's add another level of recognition about what these films are trying to do have a social conscience. They're providing commentary in an entertaining way about what's going on in our real world. Begins was written around 2003-2004, right after the hysteria of post-9-11 anthrax attack fears. The culmination of Ra's al Ghul's plans is to unleash fear via a powder substance on Gotham and let the city tear itself apart. The resemblance is not a coincidence. This artist's awareness continues in the dark night as escalation of terror wars leads to extremes on both sides. The attackers get more innovative and the question of freedom versus safety is pondered. Here, Lucius Fox objects to the Big Brother powers Batman has created for himself. This is wrong. I've got to find this man, Lucius. 
At what cost? On a personal thematic level, the Joker is the perfect opponent for Batman because the question has now become, how far will Bruce go to achieve his goals? In many ways, the Joker is the insane version of Batman. This brings up the duality aspect of the story, sane versus insane, and civil versus savage. The ultimate visualization of this is the two boats, two bombs, jigsaw style game the Joker makes the citizens of Gotham play. Having lost everyone he cares about other than Alfred, Batman is forced, sort of in a deus ex machina, hand of the writer's gods kind of way, to become the bad guy. Of course, Batman and Commissioner Gordon couldn't have just blamed Harvey's death on the Joker. Is there really anybody that would doubt anyone but the Joker kill Dent? It's a minor story structure gripe. All of this flows into The Dark Knight Rises. Batman has made a great sacrifice, become essentially a bad guy in the public eye, leading to the anti-crime Dent Act, which somehow has helped keep the peace in Gotham. When you cleaned up the streets, you cleaned them good. Pretty soon we'll be chasing down overdue library books. The streets are free of extreme villainy, and ironically, it's Batman's inaction and retirement that has finally accomplished his objective. This is where the writers of the series mash up various comic book source material, providing a story that had Batman adaptation DNA in it, which allows it to grow into a fresh, satisfying movie experience. So when interpreting this recent quote by Christopher Nolan regarding the lack of importance of source material, remember it's about inspiration more than it is being faithful to the DC Universe. We saw the influences of The Man Who Falls and Batman Year One in Batman Begins. For The Dark Knight, it was Batman the Killing Joke and Batman the Long Halloween. For Rises, it's The Dark Knight Returns, Nightfall, and No Man's Land. At this point of the preview review, we're going to speculate on the story of The Dark Knight Rises and reveal some potential would-be surprises, as well as spoiling details of these source material comic books. These are unconfirmed, unofficial story details that might or might not be in the movie based on an educated guess. Proceed at your own risk. The element from The Dark Knight Returns that The Dark Knight Rises is borrowing is two-pronged. First, Bruce Wayne has retired as a vigilante. In the comic book, it's been ten years. Here in Rises, it's going to be eight. The second part that's similar is that there's a series of attacks on Gotham by a crime force too powerful for the police to handle. This forces him out of retirement and back into costume. In Nightfall, and yes, I read all of this, and it was pretty f awesome. Bane, obsessed with defeating Batman and taking control of Gotham, decides to push him past the brink of exhaustion, physically and mentally, by releasing all of the super criminals from Arkham Asylum. Bane then studies Batman as he battles with and recaptures all of them until it's time to finally attack him when he's at his weakest. No Man's Land is a storyline that spanned the entire year of 1999 in the DC Universe. In it, Gotham has been hit by a massive earthquake and declared uninhabitable by the U.S. government. People of Gotham, we have not abandoned you. What's that mean? It means we're on our own. All the bridges are destroyed and entrance into the city is forbidden. Commissioner Gordon and the police stay behind to battle various gangs and super criminals who are carving up the territory and taking control of the remaining city. Obviously, all of these elements are evident visually in the Dark Knight Rises trailers. The question is, what order will these events take place? If we look at the prologue that was released during the Mission Impossible 4 IMAX screenings, it seems that Bane allows himself to be captured so he can kidnap a scientist from this plane. Notice the similarities visually with the Tokyo sequence in The Dark Knight and the hallway battle in Inception. Why kidnap the scientist? Because he has earthquake-causing technology. Bruce Wayne will probably be shown next, establishing his retirement and new style of life. This is when Selina Kyle will make her appearance. She'll already be working for Bane and is gathering information about Bruce, the person who Bane, just like in the comic book, suspects of being Batman. Bane's entire plan has been in the works for a long time, possibly since Ra's al Ghul's death over a decade earlier. 
In the comics, Al Ghul trains and actually names Bane as his successor to the League of Shadows. At this point, various chaos befalls Gotham. The football game is used as an announcement of Bane's arrival. He kills the mayor in the skybox. Then, the inmates of a Gotham prison are freed, with the help of Catwoman, who was in prison earlier as an inside cat woman. This leads to Gordon being hospitalized and him pleading with Bruce to return in the first teaser. The Batman has to come back. What if he doesn't exist anymore? He must. Somewhere in this first act, Bruce has a flashback of his training with Ra's al Ghul. It's possible that Bane will be shown as one of the pupils in the League of Shadows stronghold while Bruce was training. The returning Batman helps restore order to Gotham after the earthquake, but is too out of shape to maintain the pace for too long. During one of Bruce's gatherings at the manor, possibly here when he's talking with Catwoman, Because when it hits, you're all going to wonder how you ever thought you could live so large and leave so little for the rest of us. You sound like you're looking forward to it. Bane crashes the party, much like the League of Shadows did in Batman Begins. Bruce goes to the Batcave, which, like everything here, obeys the, in sequels, set pieces must be new, different, and supersized. Wayne Manor will be rebuilt exactly as it was, but that the Batcave will be expanded and brought forward technologically. Where, just like in the Nightfall saga, he cripples our hero. Look how exhausted the Dark Knight is here. Now at this point, is the movie going to be faithful to the Nightfall source material and have Bane break Batman's back? If we've learned anything from how these writers adapt the comics, it's more of a process of inspiration than it is imitation. This has not been a series that literally translates. It takes ideas and makes them work in a different medium. In the Nightfall storyline, Batman's back is broken and he can't walk until he's eventually healed by mystical alternative medicine. That wouldn't work here. Not to say that alternative medicine doesn't have its merits, but more to the fact that this is a vision that is grounded in total physical reality. Even the slightest hint of the supernatural or even spiritual would alter this tone too drastically. Another element of the Nightfall story is that while Batman is crippled, he appoints Jean-Paul Valley to take his place as a crime fighter, to wear the costume and uphold the standards established to maintain the psychological presence of Batman for the people of Gotham. Since there's no apprentice type character here to pass the mantle to, it's unlikely that his injury will be so catastrophic. Catastrophic. Unless the solution is some kind of robo-bionic version of the Batsuit created by Lucius Fox. There is one mystery character here that could potentially be Batman's replacement. Joseph Gordon-Levitt playing John Blake. You got something you want to ask me, Officer Blake? It's about that night, this night, eight years ago, the night Dent died. The last confirmed sighting of the Batman. He murders those people. Takes down two SWAT teams, breaks Dent's neck, and then just vanishes. I'm not hearing a question, sir. Don't you want to know who he was? Why is this character being introduced now? Officially, he's a police officer, but what does he add to the story that can't be communicated through Jim Gordon? Is he going to take over for Gordon because he's going to die in this one? Or is he going to put on the bat suit, which means that Batman is badly hurt or possibly dies? These are all potentialities, but the most likely scenario is that Bane hurts Batman horribly enough to capture him and take him back to the prison where Bane lived until Ra's al Ghul, who likes to go to prisons to find his pupils rescued him. Why didn't you just kill me? Your punishment must be more severe. One of the elements of great drama, of great storytelling, is crafting an opponent we totally believe has a chance of defeating the main character. While we always know the hero will come out as the victor in the end, it's the journey of getting there that's interesting, entertaining, and delightfully stressful. We know we're having a great time when we're on the edge of our seats thinking that the happy ending might actually not occur.
Think back to the great villains in movie history. They've provided that for us. That's the reason we love the Dark Knight so much, because of the Joker. We believed he had a chance to defeat Batman. And it might be the reason we kind of have a slight, uneasy feeling about Bane. Do we believe that he can really defeat Batman? If all we have as reference for the character is what we saw in Batman and Robin... <laughs> Definitely no, but if we take a look at Bane's comic book origin, we'll be convinced otherwise. Bane is born in a prison. He grows up in isolation with his mother until her death, and then he's released into the general population as a young boy. During an attack, he falls, is badly hurt, and has a psychotic vision that he's meant for greatness. When he wakes up, he's a savage and put in isolation. There, he cultivates the strength of his body by doing a thousand push-ups a day and the power of his mind by reading three books every day and meditating for hours. He becomes the leader of the inmates and is volunteered by the warden in an attempt to kill him off to take part in super soldier experiments, which he miraculously survives. Powered by a steroid-type substance known as Venom, he becomes an unstoppable superpower force. He hears about Gotham and Batman, and because bats have been a reoccurring theme in his dreams, becomes certain that he is destined to destroy Batman and rule Gotham. He escapes and goes forth to realize his plans. He's smart, strong, and ruthless. This guy can definitely break the bat. One aspect of the adaptation here that might be controversial for comic book fans is that here in Rises, Bane does not use the Venom. The mask seen here provides a painkiller that helps him deal with an injury he received while in jail, but in no way enhances his strength. How do you feel about that, movie lovers? Is this changing the character too much? Leave your thoughts in the comments section. Most likely, Catwoman and John Blake help rescue Batman and the three of them along with Gordon and the police battle in an epic conclusion on the streets of Gotham where Batman defeats Bane. The major question here is how does the series end in an emotionally satisfying way? Roz wanted to wipe the slate clean. The Joker wanted to watch the world burn. Bane wants to bring a reckoning to Gotham. When Gotham is ashes. You have my permission to die. This is where the bigger social picture comes into play for The Dark Knight Rises. There's the image here of Wall Street being hijacked. Then here, the rich are stripped of their possessions, of their control. This installment seems to very much tap into the Occupy Wall Street movement, into the 99% versus 1% feeling that has been building since October 2008. I take what I need from those who have more than enough. I don't stand on the shoulders of people with less. Well enough. I think I do more to help someone than most of the people in this room, than you. I think maybe you're assuming a little too much. Maybe you're being unrealistic about what's really in your pants other than your wallet. Ouch. You think all this can last? There's a storm coming, Mr. Wayne. If Bane is a reckoning, what is the payment he demands from Gotham? In reality, Bruce is a one percenter who is trying to give back. He wants to strike a balance. But Bane is much more like Tyler Durden. He wants all accounts zeroed out. He wants to bring down the entire system. Batman has been trying to repair the system, but what if it's too flawed to begin with? What happens if, much like the eight-year post-Harvey Dent death piece, it's all built on a lie that can't be hidden forever. The truth will come out one day, and on that day of reckoning, a new world shall emerge. What kind of world is up for debate? As Bruce was told by Roz, to make yourself more than a man and into a legend is the goal. And as Bruce later tells Alfred, he wants to become something elemental, something that will maintain through the years. Will Batman find someone new to carry on his cause? Or will regular people become the heroes, much like Harvey Dent could have been, so that Batman Batman is no longer necessary. Nolan has said that these things end, and his version of Batman is not like the comic book where the balloon is infinitely blown up. Passing the Batman baton over to a new person is something the comics needed so new stories could be told and new issues sold. With Batman as a movie franchise rebooting soon, we can assume that Rises is a self-contained story with a definite end, and the fact that there's been no hint or setup in any way that Bruce as a person 
person wants a son or protege, it would seem very forced if here all of the sudden he became Obi-Wan searching for Luke. This has always been a story about the journey of Bruce and only Bruce Wayne. In Batman Begins, he was a scared, confused, angry young man who he needed to create Batman in order to survive and to give Gotham hope. In The Dark Knight, Bruce wanted to let go of Batman in order to have a normal life with Rachel. But circumstances created an even deeper fusion with Batman. In Rises, will he be the Bruce from The Dark Knight Returns? In human form, pretending to be the average billionaire. But in reality, feeling incomplete without Batman. In that comic, it becomes clear that once he returns to fighting crime, he truly feels himself, and it's Bruce Wayne that is really the costume, and Batman that is really the person. The final scene in Rises is reported to be very emotional. Will it be Bruce Wayne teaching the sons of Batman in the Batcave how to carry on the tradition? Or will it be a V for Vendetta style, we are Batman, citizens of Gotham Unite ending that stirs our spirits? Or will it be Peter Parker reveals himself as Spider-Man in part two? While it's Batman who rises back from the dead to defeat Gotham's greatest threat, the thematic journey established in Begins logically and emotionally calls for the journey of Bruce Wayne to close the story as established in this Nolan universe. It has to come full circle. The destination this is traveling towards is that Bruce Wayne will reveal himself as Batman, most likely at the end as he's fighting Bane without a mask for all to see. At this moment, we realize that there's always been a better role model than Harvey Dent. It's always been Bruce Wayne. The legend of a man who became a legend and then became a man is more powerful than a man who became became just a legend. Wait, that kind of sounds like something from a Mel Brooks movie. I am your father's, brother's, nephew's, cousin's former roommate. In time, legends become myth, and myths become fiction, and fiction rarely inspires real life action. To serve as an inspiration, remaining human seems a much more powerful symbol to future generations than becoming legend. Why do we now, still after many years, admire Martin Luther King and Gandhi? Because they were flesh and blood and vulnerable. They were real. And they acted with courage in the face of fear. And that scares the average person because it means that we can also act as they acted. If it's a Batman, if it's a superhero, part of us knows that we're unable to do the things that this supernatural being is accomplishing. But if it's revealed just to be an average human with above average courage, then the responsibility to take action falls to us. While it takes courage to put on a mask, a hero is someone who takes it off. We will only be emotionally affected if this series, if this saga ends with Bruce. While it's been the story of Batman rising, it's really been the story of Bruce emerging. Rises seems to be thematically about crumbling lies and emerging truth, about a world built on deception and the corruption that occurs from this insecure foundation. Bane crumbles the house of cards that has become Gotham and everyone in it, and Bruce has not been immune to this. Batman is his lie, and revealing who is behind the mask is part of Gotham's reckoning. Batman may just die here, but it'll be Bruce, not Bane, that kills him. Isn't it great that we don't know exactly where the character's journey is going to end? It makes it such an unpredictable joy to watch. Unlike, say, other recent films of this summer, <coughs> Prometheus, there's one last mystery character added here, Mrs. Cobb from Inception. Some theories have her being the daughter of Ra's al Ghul, who seeks revenge. Her character's name is Miranda Tate. She's a totally new creation for this film and here is meant to replace a sense of personal hope and maybe romantic purpose that Bruce has lost through the death of Rachel. Or the long shot possibility is that she'll be the female Robin a la The Dark Knight Returns. The last seven years have been a great time to be a superhero and especially a Batman fan. This trilogy has revolutionized so many things about film. The darker and more realistic tone, the sweeping, powerful, inspiring score, the genre set pieces, themes, and social awareness. It really has been a great blend of what's possible when the commercial and the art have a movie yin-yang balance. 
In many ways, this trilogy has been a justice-seeking cinematic vigilante, setting by example the standards for a movie future which can enlighten and entertain, where our imagination is stimulated, our hearts stirred, and our souls inspired. For every lazy, by-the-numbers, assembly line would-be blockbuster that's been released, we've had Batman to redeem Hollywood. But there's only so much one man or one movie franchise can do. Today, character and theme-free box office seeking genre set piece porn abominations have been unleashed on us like all the inmates of Arkham Asylum. There's too many to fight, and not enough complete filmmaking to counteract it. Perhaps a sign that this battle has already been lost is the fact that there's a Batman reboot planned. This Batman's heart is still beating, and its grave is already dug. That makes it feel like Hollywood is a creatively decimated, one-time thriving metropolis of ideas and inspiration. The night is always darkest before the dawn, and the phoenix can only rise from the ashes of its former self. Batman and Gotham will rise from its fall, from its darkness. Hopefully, it's a lesson, an example, that can find its wisdom and courage translated into the medium that has brought it to life. Movies, much like popular music today, have been hijacked by the accountants. They deal in mummified resale of past inspiration. The artist is in touch with the now, the current truth. Unsure if it'll be profitable, but certain that it is relevant. The goal of art is to communicate to people, not to collect from them. Hollywood is not hiding the fact that it's commercial and needs box office success in order to survive. It used to be able to do that with products that had heart and smarts, but this success led to greed and greed corrupted. It has created a short-sighted payoff down a road which has led to long-term disaster a creative no man's land. If humans physically need air, water, and food to survive, then mentally and spiritually, we need story to thrive. The better the story is told, the better the people will be. In his book, Man's Search for Meaning, psychologist and Holocaust survivor Viktor Frankl shared some wisdom that applies here. Don't aim at success. The more you aim at it and make it a target, the more you are going to miss it. For success like happiness cannot be pursued. It must ensue. And it only does so as the unintended side effect of one's personal dedication to a cause greater than oneself or as the byproduct of one's surrender to a person other than oneself. Happiness must happen. And the same holds for success. You have to let it happen by not caring about it. I want you to listen to what your conscience commands you to do and go on to carry it out to the best of your knowledge then you will live to see that in the long run in the long run I say success will follow you precisely because you have forgotten to think about it one's personal dedication to a cause greater than oneself sounds a lot like Batman when will it sound like us the Dark Knight Rises is worthy of big screen viewing in IMAX. We'll see it because of the director, actor, and story factors. It pushes boundaries, looks holy f awesome, has the power to inspire, stimulates imagination, is socially relevant, Christopher Nolan has carte blanche, it'll be an automatic childhood memory, it's the end of a cinematic franchise, is perfect for a bros night out, because we have obsessive compulsive franchise disorder, and it exists because of the pre-existing fan base, which is gonna guarantee box office. When it comes to the battle against the movie apocalypse, this is absolutely a sign of movie hope. Back in 2008, The Dark Knight made $158 million opening weekend. This year, The Avengers made 207, but it was in 3D, so the ticket sales were slightly jacked up. With tickets for The Dark Knight Rises already on sale, screenings in IMAX, and the backlash over Bane's mumbly voice forgotten, the realization that the future reboot of the series won't be anything like this, The Amazing Spider-Man, and with it being the end of a long journey, look for this to make around 190 million opening weekend. This definitely doesn't seem as kid-friendly as The Avengers, so there might be some parents who won't take their younger children to see it, which will cause it to lose some box office traction. That's the only reason this won't break the record, though it really would be great if it did. With no major releases to compete against it until August 3rd, when the Total Recall remake arrives, 
Rises has two weeks to absolutely do whatever it wants and clean box office house. The Dark Knight made a billion worldwide, and if Rises comes through its story and character, it'll have enough repeat viewing worthiness to bring it back to that level. And let's remember, it has to defeat the Transformers trilogy. Dark of the Moon, which had no journey and no culmination of any kind of arcing bigger mega story, made 1.1 billion worldwide. So let's hope, just for the sake of good movie pride, that this can do better than that. Because if it doesn't, then we're still in a very dire and dark place in our movie world. Because of all these factors, this absolutely raises the level of our story consciousness. When it comes to its place in movie history, it has all the signs of being that rare film in a trilogy that is the best of the series. I know, the immediate reaction is to say this is not going to be better than The Dark Knight. But let's ask ourselves a question. Are we saying The Dark Knight is a better movie than The Dark Knight Rises, or do we mean that the Joker is a better villain than Bane? I definitely feel the Joker will be more interesting and memorable than Bane, but as a complete total movie experience, from the genre to the drama, Rises will be better. So what do you think, movie lovers? What needs to happen in The Dark Knight Rises for you to consider it a complete and satisfying movie? Leave your thoughts in the comments section. If you like what you've seen, make sure to subscribe to this channel and also follow me all over the internet here. So consider yourselves advised for The Dark Knight Rises. Remember, Hollywood, aka Story Corp, give us more of what we pay for. So let's choose our movies wisely. And until next time, long live good movies.